Good. Okay, this is the uh, policy committee meeting for February 18th, um, School District of Waukesha. Uh, Lynn, has the meeting been properly posted? Yes, it has. Thank you. Uh, this would be the opportunity for any citizens to address us if they wish. They, there is nobody here. Well, let me check. Were you planning to address us? No. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I will back off on it. I was just asking the question, so thank you. And we have no bright lights this afternoon either. We do have some action items. Uh, as a matter of information, the uh, minutes were not included in tonight's packet. We will, we will cover those at the March meeting yep. along with the February uh, minutes. So that's why they're not on the agenda. But we do have three, po <coughs> excuse me, three policies for discussion and uh, approval. Policy 0167.3. This is the, the uh, policy on public participation at board meetings, their opportunity for citizens to address us. We've talked about this both in the committee meeting previously and uh, presented at the board meeting for comments. Uh, I believe everything that's in and the version this afternoon is the stuff we've talked about previously. Uh, just for, if anybody else is watching, the things we've included, we've changed the, some of the terminology so we don't refer it to the citizen, we refer to the public. Um, we, we, use, we are not using the term di district resident anymore. We're just saying any individual that wishes to discuss with the board. And then we get on to the uh, longer pieces where we talk about um, the, pers the person is to, that's coming to, wants to speak with the board should sign up 15 minutes before the meeting starts with a form we've been using, um, requires their name, the complete address, and topic that they wish to discuss with us. And if, if a person does not wish to address us but does wish to let us know that they have a, a comment that they would just want us on paper, that is included in doing that on that form. And the other item is dealing with a speaker shall be limited to two to three minutes. That's been standard. We do have a piece added in here. Speakers who require language interpretation support in order to speak to the board shall be given up to six minutes to speak to allow time for the interpreter to convey their message. And then further down, we talk about the 30 minute time and it can be uh, determined by the president or the committee chair if there is a reason to um, limit it or extend it if they wish. And the last change was added on the bottom was uh, unless required by the Americans with Disability Act, no individual shall utilize presentation technology during this public comment period. So. That, I believe, is everything we covered at the last meeting. Diane? I, I, the, some of the changes in C, where we talked about the registration form, was, I, I think, briefly mentioned, but I think this is the specific language that goes with the form that is available at the meetings. Correct. Yeah, so yeah. it's just a matter of, of you know, giving, uh, adding the concept that you can register your opinion rather than necessarily getting up and speaking if there are 20 people that have the same topic that they're they're. That addressing. is the intention, yes. Okay. Uh, this is an action item. So anybody wish to uh, move for approval of 0167.3? Diane? I so move that we accept the modifications to policy 167.3, public participation at board meetings, as presented. I'll second it, if I may. Second it. Uh, further questions or discussion on this policy? Uh, we've done it before, so if you don't have any, that's just fine. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, then all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? 3-0, Thank you. Excellent. And that will be carried forward to the full board in March. Okay, the next one is policy 2431, interscholastic athletics and district activities. And this uh, is the one that... Give us some information out of, uh, this is WIAA, w nope. yeah. The WIAA um, has put a statement in there um, under violations requiring additional oh, yeah. penalties. 
Any student charged and or convicted of a felony shall, upon the filing of the felony charges, become ineligible for all further participation in the co courts considered the sentence served, including probation, community service, et cetera. We modified that language a little bit at the last committee meeting. Right. Uh, but this language is required if we want to maintain compliance with the WIAA rules for uh, participation. And, and the, the way we've, we've interpreted it, that we changed a few of the wordings, but we're still that, okay. We're okay. It. Yep. That's important, yeah. And I think that was the only change on this one, wasn't it? Yes, it is. In this policy, the athletic oh. directors have stayed very current. Um, if you can... If you look on the back page of the Neola, uh, the back page of the policy, you can see that this has been in front of us in September of this year, July of this, uh, I'm sorry, September of 19, July of 19, uh, and then it was passed uh, in December of 17. So our ADs do stay on top of our policy, our handbooks, and, um, and then anything that comes out of the state as it pertains to governing athletics in the district. Yes, it's been a well-traveled policy. There is there's a minor change on... Uh, Third page where we added, just to, to help people, we added the term graduation requirements to the policy 5460 so that the, um, the, the title of the policy was standing right there for you to see. So, any, any other questions on this? If not, I'd be seeking a motion for approval of 2431. I'll move to approve the revisions to policy 2431 interscholastic athletics and district activities. Thank you. I second the motion. Thank you. And by the way, that term activities, we added that in a previous visit, didn't we? Uh, we added that, I believe it was in September. Yes. Um, you know, well, to, it was previously just athletics, but it, it, it now in, incorporates some other activities as well. Yes. Okay. Any other discussion? If not, all in favor, please. Oh, I'm fair, please say, oh, you had discussion? I was just going to say, it. I'm sorry, if I may. No, please. It makes sense. And I know the changes we talked about, there was a discussion at the last policy meeting. Um, I raised, a, I guess, a question about are we punishing someone for something they haven't been convicted of? Uh, Dr. Cook's comment was well made that this athletics in the district is a privilege. Um, and we talked about sometimes the significant delay between being charged and some sort of criminal resolution that they, someone who is, in fact, eventually found guilty could be the remainder of the season right. so I agree with this um, and I think it makes sense so but thank you okay <clears throat> we have a motion and a second uh, all in favor please say aye aye, aye. opposed also three zero in thank you. okay then uh, the third action item is policy five six zero zero point zero one disciplinary consequences for student misconduct and um, what we were dealing with there was <clears throat> it was automatically a uh, level three discipline with an expulsion if you were found to be in, uh, in use or sale or distribution or being under the influence, and those are, that's the critical words there, of alcohol, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the policy change that's being uh, discussed here is whether the under the influence could be reconsidered for a level one. And Joe's got some interesting background as to why this becomes. Sure. So, I mean, I, I think we said at the last meeting, if, if we can all remember back to when we were in high school, 20 and then plus years ago, um, you may have had a student or friend of yours or whomever it might have been, an acquaintance who had a beer at lunch, came to school, and the principal caught him, and they were suspended from school for a day for having just consumed the beer at lunch. Um, I've had some experience when I was an assistant principal where we had kids that were incredibly intoxicated at school um, and, you know, that they perhaps were suspended for three days or for five days and, um, you know, given the underage drinking citation and, and, and so on and so forth. Currently, we do about 120 pre-expulsions a year. Um, half of those are for kids who come to school under the influence. Um, and within those, that 50% of those, that requires that those kids are suspended from school for five days and then that they get a pre-expulsion hearing with Luke Pinion or me or another central office administrator. And um, the idea that just being under the influence would be treated to the same level as, you know, bringing drugs to school to distribute 
or any of those other level three offenses. What we would like administratively is to have the latitude to use judgment with that. Um, you know, under the influence may be that you're suspended from school and referred to the SRO uh, for an underage drinking citation or whatever it might be. It might mean that your, act, your actions were such that you do still trigger the pre-expulsion review, but as it currently states, we don't have that administrative uh, uh, judgment to, to use, we just have to go right to pre-expulsion with it. And we don't feel that that's an appropriate penalty for all of the cases that result in, you know, that result from uh, being under the influence at school. Uh, so what we're still asking, you know, we still are, we're not going to talk about changing the use or the possession or the sale on school grounds, the distribution. Uh, it's simply that being under the influence piece that we're requesting be moved. The, uh, an interesting factor that you shared with me was the amount of time we're spending on, I'm going to use the word unnecessary pre-expulsions because this is a one-time event for this kid or whatever. Yep. You might want to share that. Yeah, so, you know, a pre-expulsion, um, when, when a student is suspended from school uh, for a level three offense, that requires coordination between the school and the district office. Um, when the Pre-expulsion is put together, it's added time, about a half a day of time for the administrator at the school level to go through and make sure that we've done the, um, the necessary foundation work to hold that pre-expulsion meeting. And then it involves Luke Pinion's time or my time to the tune of about another half day just to address that pre-expulsion. And in some instances, then it's a matter of assigning that case uh, for monitoring to somebody else in the district. So you're getting into a lot of extra time for a pre-expulsion. Now, for some of the things that you see on there, um, endangering the health and safety, those expellable offenses, uh, or you know something that involves substantial drugs, um, all of that time is worth it. Uh, but again, the kid who went out and you know drank with their friends at lunch, you know that can be handled by parents, that can be handled by the school resource officer, that can be handled uh, by a school level disciplinary infraction, and not necessarily trigger that extra step. Um, Five days of school is a lot of time. Um, if, if you are suspended from school uh, for five days, you are missing that week of instruction. Even though we provide you with your homework and we kind of give you an idea as to where you're coming back from, that's, that, you know, that's a full week a full week out. And there are crucial times during the year, for instance, for the student, you know, the, the junior or senior who you know, uses poor judgment, uh, but then comes into the AP testing window. You know, you miss an eight, a week of AP review because you decided to have a drink at lunch or whatever it is. I mean, that, I think that that's a little bit harsh and has m much more substantial of a penalty than what we would need to apply for just this, this type of offense. Critical, critical factor is we have not removed the opportunity to expel them or whatever. Right. It's right. just that we're going to think about it before Correct. we jump into it. Diane? Just two comments. Um, could the first offense have the range of one to five days that the penalty would be the same as it is now? You know, in terms of, again, not that they have to have the five days, but it could be five days. Yeah, so, so if you look at any of the one, uh, items A through T under one, mm -hmm. you know, it, level two is essentially the clarifier of that. Right. You know, so the first sentence, serious violations or repeated violations of the above will result in suspension or pre-expulsion. So... We don't have to say one to five days. Um, it doesn't necessarily go down into, it doesn't mean the, because we, we say it's a general rule that a first offense would be a one to three, a second offense would be a five day. But a substantial first violation could trigger the five day suspension and the pre expulsion review. We still have that ability uh, with the proposed language. Um, it, I don't think it requires a modifier there from, okay. you know, for making sure that this policy, again, what I'd like to remind you, the board of is this policy used to be the administrative guideline. Um, so the, admi the, admi the administrative guideline that was associated with this policy, when we went from our old policy book and, and reviewed and went to NEOLA, we took that administrative guideline and carried it forward as our policy. Um, so, so this is our historical language and it's been how we've been practicing for a very long time. So my second question would be, the, the, talking about missing five days is, it can have a huge impact yep. on, on a student and their preparation for AP testing or whatever the situation might be, or final exams. Could in-school suspensions be 
used in those kinds of situations that they're not just going home and having a party in a five days off? Well, we will use in school when it's appropriate. But okay. if you've done something that requires an out-of-school suspension, um, you know, you are then being turned over your par- to your parents uh, for their supervision during that period of time. Um, so we do use in-school. Um, we use in-school more frequently than we use out-of-school suspension as a district. Usually it's for minor things that are one to two days in nature. Um, we're not assigning a kid to a week of in-school suspension um, because if you do something that is that substantial, um, then, then you are turned over to your parents for supervision. And, and in some instances, you're right, it does turn into, you know, play your video games and sleep late every day. Um, you know, but the reality of it is that is a substantial violation to trigger five days worth of mm-hmm. class removal. If I may, thank you. And this, as far as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, is no way, shape, or form permits or encourages students to go out and drink. Obviously. Absolutely not. I mean, that's... That, it has to go without saying, but it must be set. It also no way, shape, or form reduces, as the chairman said, the district's ability to use that higher level punishment. Correct. It just gives the administration more discretion. Correct. Um, and I said this before, so I don't want to repeat it at length, but we're not raising saints. Or I'm certain we're not, we, our <laughs> student, we're not raising anybody, but our students are not, they're students, they're kids, they're going to make mistakes. Correct. To give the administration the discretion to appropriately craft the, the punishment and the retribution is, I think, more than appropriate. And it doesn't in any way, shape, or form alleviate other punishments for these students. Right. If someone under the age of 21 <clears throat> has a beer, half a beer, a sip of beer, any detectable amount of alcohol, and they hop in their vehicle and drive back to campus and get pulled over, it's a not a drop law. They get an OWI yep. um, on top of every other punishment that comes along with that. So it doesn't change any of that. Correct. And, and from district sanctions, I mean, understand that, you know, we, we can do the loss of privilege, you know, within the scope of the school day. Uh, you lose the uh, athletic eligibility. We just looked at the interscholastic athletic policy. So uh, <coughs> drinking violation does trigger suspension from athletics and activities. Um, you know, again, and it does, it may, you know, you may use poor judgment once and, you know, we, we want to be able to have the ability to work with you. But if you do it again, you start to fall into those repeated and if you repeatedly do it, that could trigger the pre-expulsion. So we do have those abilities. We've also, um, Luke provided an update to the board, I believe it was in September, where we started to partner with uh, uh, AODA, um, you know, um, program uh, for students that are in violation uh, of uh, alcohol or drug uh, violation, uh, that we can get them into a, it's a four-part series uh, where they get education on it. Um, you know, I wouldn't go so far as to call it treatment, but it's educational in nature. Um, we do have that available to kids at our high schools, and um, and, and that can be assigned, um, often is assigned for, for drug violations. So... Okay, uh, Joe, I have a question. It's just it's a wordsmithing type of a sure. thing. I apologize for those because I don't like them. But on item F under level three, <clears throat> we refer to use, possession, sale, or distribution. And then the words we're taking out are, are being under the influence. Use, are we saying use on school district property? Correct. Because under being under the influence would say they used it. Yeah, so I but, wonder if we need to, do, do we need to say for the first four items that this is, a, is on school district property or not? Well, I, I, the, the burden to prove as an administrator where you did it can sometimes be very tricky. Okay. Especially in, in, um, in relation to, I'm thinking like South High School and North High School where uh, you do have the ability, the open campus availability. And at North High School, for instance, right across the street is Lowell Park. Um, kids could walk across the street there, and that's where they could do their whatever, and then come back to school and, and be under the influence. South High School, for instance. But aren't they also using it? Well, they, they are using it, um, but I don't want it to get into a, did I use it okay. on school grounds or did I not oh, use it on school grounds? If, we, if I walk okay. into the boys' bathroom and I see kids smoking dope there, that, in my mind, is enough then to trigger, hey, you brought drugs into our school, you are using drugs uh, in our schools, okay. we should look at you for a pre-expulsion. Okay. Um, but, but we do, you know, you do get the kids who, for instance, would smoke weed on their way to school in the morning. They come to school and they're high, they're under the influence. Um, you know, we can treat that one way then. Um, or, you, oh. you know, you take that a step further, you deal with the lunch hours where uh, kids leave, they do something stupid, they come back to school, they get caught. Um, and that's really just the, it's the only adjustment. And, and Luke and I, in, in reviewing this policy, 
um, and looking at what our data is showing us, it's that under the influence piece. We, we will deal with use on our school grounds okay. under this because use then can also lead to distribution. You know, I, I brought the weed to school yeah. and, and, you know, we go and as a group get together and we smoke it at school, then, you know, we're, you know, that, that, that's, I think in my mind and in most of our administrators mind, that's a higher threshold okay. versus me doing something at home and coming to school and disrupting the school day. So you're, you're comfortable on the administrative level that this, this will work with the word use in there. I, I think it, it, it helps us out substantially and it, I think it gives us the judgment that we need to use around the kids that we are addressing. Um, you know, one of the hardest things for us to deal with is the, the you know, the high school senior um, who is nearing the end of their high school career, who before those big testing windows decides to do something stupid. Um, and then you're, well, you know, you're at a five day with a pre-expulsion contract and, you know, I, I mean, I think we want to be able to have some judgment. In, in I, I would hope so. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, Diane? I think another element of this is now being under the influence can be directed to the SRO, you know, bit more, more readily than back in the day when, like, this policy probably was originally written. Yes. You know, and, and that is a more immediate response and the, you know, is there a violation of the not a drop law? You know, is there, is there a violation of the, you know, the citation for underage drinking? And, and all those sorts of things can be addressed like without having to get into the, the you know the, the parental involvement to, to to see that there's a consequence for what they've done, and I think that that, that can be reflected here too because we do have that resource yeah. available our in the high, building. At our high school and middle schools, our SROs do assist us. You know when we are you know suspect that a student is under the influence, yeah. we're able mm -hmm. to you know have sobriety tests performed. Um, um, but again, we we still want to have the latitude to say. Is this a one-day suspension? Is this a three-day suspension? Or does it, in fact, trigger the need for a pre-expulsion? And I think that's why you brought this to us. And it's, it's clear this is more flexible. Yes. And it is not intended to be less strict. Right, right. It's just if, we need it, we, if we need it, we use it. Yep. Okay. And, and, and not, to, not to harm kids' academic no. progress just because they made a stupid mistake and sometimes it is a one-time stupid mistake right yeah, a lot not of the, always but a lot of the situations that luke deals with in this category are one-time stupid mistakes this will wake or up. i would say instead of mistakes stupid lapses in judgment um you know mistakes i don't know how, are if you don't know how that could ever happen <laughs> <laughs> so okay good any other thing any before you that yeah where does vaping fit into all of this and as being a new Relatively yeah, new. You know, it's, it's actually, it's, um, we have that in here. We did bring it um, in. We have that, actually, it's specifically spelled out in our, uh, our tobacco and other drug policy. Um, I would have to tell you where it fits into. We did um, bring it in. Possession or use of tobacco in any form, item number L, uh, is how we have uh, treated that in this policy. Yes. But we do have a specific policy on mm -hmm. uh, tobacco and uh, drugs on the school grounds. Bring so, vaping in. Yeah, but it covers, we specifically spell yeah, it out. And, you know, vaping. I think the discouraging thing to know is, is that the tobacco bill, I believe it was at the state level, they rejected vaping in there, um, which was going to bring vaping and tobacco use up to age 21. Mm -hmm. um, but for some reason, they didn't think that vaping was as big of a problem at the state level, and they kept that, I think, at 18 years old. So, serious problem. Okay, this is an action item. Let's have a race to the move. <laughs> I'll move Gregory. to <laughs> Thank you. I'll move to approve uh, the revisions to policy 5600.01, disciplinary consequences for student misconduct. Thank you. I second the motion. Seconded by Dan. Further questions or discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? 3 0 Lynn. Okay, thank you. And uh, that actually concludes our action items. We didn't have any others that were at the discussion level this evening, but you do have something you want to share with us about. Yeah, just, just to prepare you, we, uh, Lynn and I met with uh, Richard Zimmon from Neola uh, to review this next series of revisions. Um, and we had a very good discussion. It, there, were, there are 75 policies that they're recommending to revise. Um, and 
And so we looked at some of those policies, and there are a number of them where, again, our, our friends in, in Madison and in Washington, you know, they make some language changes, and those language changes then funnel into, into policy. Uh, I believe that there are a couple of new policies that we need to entertain as a school district. Um, social media, for example, is one. Uh, we'll be working with Steve Schloman and then probably branching that out. There'll be a lot of work that goes into that. You will not see as a board committee that policy for a while um, because it is pretty substantial on, on social media use. We may decide as a district that we just don't even want to try to tackle this and, and and deal with it within the scope of our, our, our employee handbooks. Um, but, but what we did, we did talk about is the fact that there is absolutely no reason that there should be 75 policy revisions that come as a result of six months, you know, worth uh, six months ish of work. Um, and, uh, and, and just so that the board knows the consultants, uh, from Neola are saying to the company, that there's no reason that you should be putting out 75 policy revisions. And so though a lot of the revisions that happen um, come as a result of a couple of school districts experiencing an issue in and around a certain policy. Um, and and what, what they do then is the, the consultants or the company, you know, they get the phone calls, they get the legal challenges, whatever it might be. And then they say, okay, we've had enough uh, question on this one. And we are going to go back to our, we're going to say to everybody, we recommend you update this policy because, and it's not necessarily that the federal government is saying that the laws changed or the state is saying that the laws changed. It's based off of the lived experience of school districts. Well, they have nearly 1500 districts that they work with. You know, so, so to take, you know, kind of a small, there's, I think, 170 school districts in Wisconsin is, that use it. You know, if you take four school districts that have had an issue, should that trigger an actual, you know, recommended policy change? Or should they put together a newsletter that says, you know, you know kind of a, a, a highlights or a spotlights thing, you know, heads up school districts, this is a policy that's coming to challenge. You guys may want to, you know, consider making the following changes. Um, but where it doesn't come up as part of this semi-annual, um, you know, bundle of policies that they that they send out. So Lynn and I, uh, we had the meeting with Richard. We have the kind of the recommended format that these policies. We took our first stab at it. Uh, she's scheduling meetings as we've done in the past, where I meet with Darren and Sharon and uh, Jody and and anybody else, Todd, um, whoever the policy would connect to, um, and then we'll see if it makes sense in Waukesha. But just understand, you may see a lot of policy come forward. Some of those changes we may just outright reject um, because it doesn't make sense for us to do the change. Other changes then will come to committee. Uh, we anticipate probably by the March policy committee, you'll start to see that bundle then. Then come. To you, so. Thank. You. I'm glad to hear it because at some point, um, it's like a self self fulfilling prophecy right. where it becomes I hate to say busy work where they're just pushing policies because it justifies their existence. That's Correct. The, that's the worst Correct. case scenario. I, I'm glad to hear the administration is filtering those things, seeing what should work right. uh, so we don't just simply get swamped with 75 yeah. policies. And you know, I mean, I still, I will always defend the, 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 uh, the NEOLA, what they do for us as a service. Um, I talk to my peers in other school districts and um, they'll use other policy type formats where they're either writing them themselves and sending them to legal counsel. And you know, now you're paying, you know, $1,500 for a single policy. Um, or where they're running into situations where uh, they have language that's really put them into a corner as to how they investigate something or um, what it says that they can or can't do. And, um, and you know, they, they get into the situation now where they're defending their position and then they're trying to rewrite their policy and there's a lot of confusion. So Neola has really put us up to speed um, and out ahead of any of the major changes. I haven't had to come to you as a panel and say, we need to change this policy because we are getting challenged through a complaint or by somebody's attorney. We're not in that, that environment anymore. Um, but again, we are at a point where it's like, okay guys, at the, you know, at the Neola office, this is not reasonable any longer. So. Interesting, I know, I know Corey wasn't with us at the time we did all this to, make the, to get started with right. this, and I don't remember if you I were wasn't or not. Either. This is, a, this is an interesting background because we used to do it all by ourselves or with anything we got out of uh, uh, WASB yep. or DPI, excuse me. Uh, you might initially think that uh, Neola, the company we went up with, has caused us a lot of extra work. The reality is, yes, it's probably extra work, but in many cases it's important extra work, stuff we were missing. This way we get it 
get it or we get it faster than we would have before, because not getting it until you say, oh my gosh, we had a problem. Mm -hmm. And we're now I guess we're looking for some, some more uh, fast ways to, no, ways to eliminate some of the stuff that is uh, you know, busy work. But in all in all, it's been, somebody who's been around for a long time and, and the way we dealt with policies before, this is much easier and more productive for us. Yeah, and I mean, it does come to us, you know, the policies come to us as a template. You know, I mean, you do get their recommended language. After you get that recommended language, the rest of it then becomes Waukesha. Um, so we do tailor it to how we operate as a district. We're not, unless it's a legal change, we're not changing how we operate as a district to meet what that template says, but we are really using those templates as a guide. Um, you know, when you don't have that, you are looking at, uh, for instance, you know, what the WASB puts out, and then you're referencing perhaps policies that they've used as exemplars. Um, but if you don't know why that district policy is very much something that's locally controlled and organic, you know, we, um, we created some policies from scratch, that field trip policy when we, <laughs> when we did the book, um, you know, how we name facilities as a policy, you know, things that we value in Waukesha, um, some of the changes that we've made uh, to our bylaws, for instance, you know, the idea of how do we entertain resolutions that came up uh, uh, you know, a couple of years ago. Um, so we've had the flexibility to take the policy templates that are recommended, make them fit our district, and we don't have to guess why another school district did what they did. You know, it's, it's generated by attorneys. It's very much in, in legal language, and then you can, you know, massage it to what you need as, a, as an organization. So. Anything else on the Neola situation? Okay, then, uh, do we have any recommendations for future committee meetings? None? I don't think so. We will have full agendas for you, so. We're going to have some agendas for us. So, yes. I think it's good that we have the new procedure in place in terms of which ones we can take care of here. And, you know, it used to be everything had oh. to go through three readings. You know, there's this multiple kind of process and back to the board and then back to the board and, and those sorts of things. And I think that we now, and, and for you as a new person, it, it, we have a new this procedure is, in place that's going to make it a lot more effective. And I, and I would share, you know, when I talked to Richard from, from Neola, you know, the way each school district handles policy is different. A lot of school districts will have a policy committee that will review and then adopt all the policies. And then there's a, a written update provided to the board and the board never as a whole takes full action on them. There are other districts that take what's recommended, they more or less adjust the language to fit the school district and they pass everything on the consent agenda um, where it's never treated individually. We here really do take things through committee, make sure that it fits our district. Um, and then we go to full board to seek you know, approval so everybody has their eyes on it. And I think that that's the most thorough way to do it. I'm not advocating go to the other way, but, but when people say, you know, we're spending a lot of time on this, we've got a big agenda, we have a big part of the board agenda, you know, understand that that's our decision to do that as a district. Um, and in some other places, they, they just treat it differently, so. Well, I remember, when was it we changed to the three tier type of thing? That's about a year? Yeah, last school year we-, we Yeah, and it's amazing. We have not one board member complain about the way oh. they don't have to go through two readings and they don't have to. <laughs> right. And so it's working as we hoped. Anything else? Our next meeting, oh, March 17th, green shirts. <laughs> or whatever. Is this a policy dress code? <laughs> <laughs> we could create a policy on a dress code if you'd like. <laughs> School uniforms is a matter oh, of my. fact. So that concludes our uh, meeting for today, and we will meet again uh, next month. Thank you. All right, we're great.